you know. And um, just recently, um, I, was, I was telling there's a brother that I, I met online who thought I was a brother, but he found it was a sister, and um, that he <laughs> wanted more information. And um, he has accepted the truth about God, took it back to the elders, and they had an elders meeting like two weeks ago. So um, keep him in praise, Brother Lionel. And um, they're asking him not to share this word, not to share it, you know. So this is just to encourage those of us uh, not to share that Jesus is the Son of God, you know, and that, uh, that Jesus is the Son of God. So um, are you ready? So our family personally have gotten us. I, 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 I was supposed to share the testimony here. The Lord had me share it earlier. But what happened is that people have said, yes, your family's cursed. Why? Because you believe this truth. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear, this is why your children are the way. This is why, because you don't believe as we believe. But our vow is to worship the God of the Bible. The right. God of the Bible. So that's what this song is about. <clears throat> I will worship the God of the Bible and not some three in one. I must worship the God of the Bible and also we son. The Bible is clear to all with humble hearts who are willing to obey, to follow inspired and not to do as tradition say I will worship the God of the Bible and not some free in one I must worship the God of the Bible and also his son for his name shall be in my forehead I will worship the God of the Bible, not some three and one. I must worship the God of the Bible, and also with son, will you worship the God of the Bible, and not some three and one. Will you worship the God? I'm just so thankful to be here at camp meeting, and I want to share a little bit of a testimony that happened to me a few months ago. I was going to be preaching at a church, and I'd been asked to preach about how to keep the Sabbath and things that we should know about how to keep the Sabbath. And so, you know, I was familiar with statements like this one, on Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done, and, of course, you know, she says God doesn't always expect us to eat cold food. We can warm up things, but let the baths be taken. It is possible to, to do this if you make it a rule, you can do it. If you make it a rule, you can do it. And, you know, she goes on to give more explicit detail. In fact, she even says it should be taught at every camp meeting. But I was going to make sure that I left home early because I had to drive several hours to get to this church. And I was going to be there on Friday evening staying with the family. And some of you know who it is because you were there. Um, but I decided I was going to leave like five hours early. I could get in like five hours before Sabbath to make sure that I was there to set a good example, to have everything taken care of. And so before I left, there were two different issues that came up that each took an hour of my time. But I'm still good. And then going down the way, I pick up a Bible study, i.e. a hitchhiker, 
and I have to help him. I have to help him, you know, get some lodging for the night and, and get some food and take care of him, do some things for him, and that takes some time. And then I do not have one accident in front of me. I have two car wrecks in front of me that traffic is stopped for. And the first one was like on the freeway where there was no way to back up, no way to go anywhere else, and to be able to make it around. So I had to wait. The second one, after I waited about a half hour, I decided, you know what? I'm backing up this road until I can get to another road, and I'm going to use my GPS and swing around this traffic. And so I did that. And I think, OK, it's getting close now, but I'm still going to get in in time. And I got to where there was a railroad crossing. And here's a train. And it's just sitting there. And after about 10 minutes, I get out, and I go up to a guy in front of me. I said, uh, are you from around here? Yeah. I said, does this train usually sit here for like 10, 20 minutes at a time? He said, no, usually it's, it's quick. But he says, maybe 10 minutes at the most. But he says, I don't know what's going on today, because it's never this long. And so I'm waiting a little bit more, and I think, well, I'm, how, how am I going to get ready? I've got to shave. I've got to bathe. How am I going to do these things before Sabbath? But God, you said, you promised me, right, Faye? You yeah. promised me. If I make it a rule, I can do it. And so I'm sitting there and kind of think, okay, look, I reach in the back and I get my toiletry bag out and I put this shaving cream on and I'm shaving there while I'm waiting on the train, you know. <laughs> it's not so easy when you, when you have a beard that's hard and, and it's not a full beard, but it's hard and so, you know, you don't have hot water, it's a little harder. But I got that done and the train still hasn't gone. So I go up and ask this guy, I said, is there any other way to get around this thing? He says, yeah, but you got to go down like 20 miles this way and cut up or something and... I said, okay. I said, well, I don't know. This thing could be here forever. I've got to go. And by now, I know I can't get there in time. What am I going to do? But as I pull out, I go by a Dollar General store. I said, wait a minute. They have gallons of water in there. I've been on the Appalachian Trail. I've been to Jamaica where you sponge bath, you know. I know how to do this. I just get a gallon of water. I've got soap with me. I've got a washcloth with me. I've got a towel with me. And so I went down to the end of the parking lot and parked the van so that, you know, I sort of had some privacy. And I could get in the van if necessary. And, you know, so I got everything taken care of. I got my, my bathing done. I got my shaving done. All those things done before Sabbath. And I just was so thankful that God helped me to see how I could do that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, we think, well, I just can't do this. My situation is different than yours or whatever. But we are told by inspiration that we can do these things if we make it a rule. And the reason that it's important to do these things, and I'm on one more minute. The reason that's important to do these things is that God wants us. He wants our time on the Sabbath. He wants my time on the Sabbath. He wants your time on the Sabbath. And if we are busy doing these other things, we lose out on that time with him. You know, it's not that God himself is a legalist. It's not that he wants us to be a legalist. He loves. He loves you and he loves me. And he wants to spend that time with us. And so I'm just so thankful that God allowed me to make that connection and, and to get that done. And I'm also thankful he gave us the weather to get down here safe in, and God is good, and I still have 20 seconds, and I'm not going to take it. I'll take it. Okay, I'm going to do, you can put me on the clock now. I'm going to give my quick testimony. I have a, a really interesting situation going on where I literally, what Faye said, maybe you have to move out by the end of the week and you don't know where you're going to move to. That's me. After camp meeting, I have to have some really serious decisions made so I have a place to sleep. <laughs> and so Todd and Rhonda and I were praying and praying, checking out everything, but finally we said, let's just put it on hold. After camp meeting, we'll deal with this. So this is my prayer time. And I've been looking at Isaiah 30, 21. I even talked to Pastor Daniel about it a little. I listened to his Isaiah chapter 30, trying to figure out that voice behind me. And it's saying, turn to the right or turn to the left. And that's what I want to hear. Just tell me, Lord. But do you know the Lord does not make you jump curbs and run into buildings? He's going to make you wait until you get to the intersection. <laughs> then he's going to say, turn right or turn left. I just haven't got to the intersection. That's it, right? So this morning was very encouraging. And um, another, just the, when I was really praying and I was struggling, you know, we can stand in faith, but faith is a fight. It's the good fight of faith. And that's what I'm doing. I'm fighting to stay in faith and keep the doubt away and just Amen. trust God. Amen. So I was saying to God, 
I want to be right in the center of your will. That's all. I'm just asking. I want to be in ministry. I want to be in the center of your will. And do you know, I heard a voice. And I'm, you know, don't think it's crazy. It's just this little thought that ran through my mind that I knew wasn't mine. Mm -hmm. And this is what it said. I want you to be in the center of my will more than you want to be there. I didn't get the answer, but I got peace. Because God knows my situation. So praise God, I have peace. God's going to take care of this. And I'm not asking you to take care of it. Please don't come and offer me something. But God's going to take care of this. And, and it's going to be perfect. Amen. Right? Amen? Amen? So now it's going to be your turn. And I do want you to try to limit it because we need to respect everybody else. Here comes Pastor Daniel. Anyways, showering, you were talking about showering in the back of your van. I would much rather do that than one of the places I've been. I was in Kenya, and I was the first white guy that anybody had ever seen in that village, in that village. And so I was sleeping for my one week there in a very, uh, very African clay hut. And um, so the shower is about that big, and the shower is literally right next to the toilet. And so when you do your thing here, you open the door and you come over here and you shower and all the stuff from your shower goes right over to where that is. And it's pretty awkward. So uh, I wouldn't mind doing it in a van. And over here is pretty nice. You might think like this place isn't doing very well. There's bugs on the floor. Well, yeah, I'm in Africa probably. <laughs> Anyways, I want to praise God that Ralph Schimmel is here. Ralph, would you raise your hand for me, please? Ralph Schimmel is the first elder of the church. Well, he used to be the first elder of the church that I pastored over in Michigan. Yeah. And I was so blessed to, to get a contact from him about, I don't know, six months ago or so. He reached out and said, hey, Pastor Daniel, how are you? And I was like, how are you? I said, well, have you uh, been interested in some of the stuff I've shared recently? I'm just wondering. He's like, I've heard it and I'm in. And so he's here, yeah. So I'm so blessed by that. I don't remember all the details of the story, but praise God for that. Glad to see you, brother. And I told him he's got to come up here. But, uh, hey, I want to tell you about Kenya. There is a group that I work with that I have been there. I've met these folk. I know them very well. They just said recently there is a group that has fasted, um, and they have prayed and fasted to the point where a 100 of them died from starvation, from hunger, right? And so they're a branch of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the civil government has come down upon Christians in the area saying, you need to follow our dictates or else you're going to be cited, etc. So they're, they're thinking about this, worrying about it, wondering what's going to be happening because now they don't want any fanatics. And guess who are the fanatics in the area? Those that eat differently, those that fast periodically, those that actually teach about fasting sometimes, those that homeschool, those that, you know, seem a little like a Seventh-day Adventist. And so it's, it's going to be tough for them. So pray for those in, Ken in Kenya. I also want to tell you about India. My dear brother, uh, Pastor Alan Stump, and I were in India recently, and that was my third time there. And we didn't get to spend as much time with each of the groups as I had before, but we probably reached, what, seven groups of pastors? And there was like, you know, between 100, maybe as low as 70, and uh, maybe up to 140. And so we reached well over 500 of these folk that were pastors in the Pentecostal church. Now, the times I had been there before, I was able to spend a lot of time with them really sharing from the Word of God everything we love so much, the law of God, the Antichrist, the second coming, what happens when you die, the health message, the truth about the Father, His Son, the ministration of holy angels, all the stuff that we love. And uh, they just receive it. We also went to Nepal to do the same thing. They wanted us to come back. They still want us to come back. And so there's a lot of revival in Kenya going on with one of the guys I want to tell you about, um, Eli. He works with the Muslims, and he has been able to convert, by God's grace through the Word of God, Muslims and baptize them outside of the Muslim camps. You can't do that there. You could be killed. Okay, so he baptizes these folk and then sends them back, and they're able to share the truth about God in a very, very Waldensian kind of style, okay? Because you could lose your head there, you understand. So that's what he's doing, ministering to these folk, and he's teaching them about the true God that actually can have a son, the one that begot, because in the Muslim world, that's not a thing. You can't, God doesn't beget, but you can tell them, no, Adam and Eve, you know, just look at them. But so they're going together. Eli is working with a man named Pastor Onyongo. 
Pastor Onyongo took the, uh, the challenge, well, the invitation. I don't like calling it a challenge because it really wasn't. It was an invitation where pastors, any pastor from any denomination, would take and watch five videos. They would go through a, a video interview with me online. I would publish it, and as a result of me publishing it, then I would pay them for their time. I'd give them a thousand bucks. It's kind of like a, a, you know, one of those hooks with a little thing at the end. And there have been five pastors that have accepted that. Maybe six now. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I'd have to look. But three of them have been converted. They are teaching the truth about God now full time. I want to tell, and that's one of the guys there in Kenya. His name is Onyongo. I want to tell you about another pastor in Ethiopia. He is a professor. I see you smiling in the back because you know that story, don't you, brother? He is a professor in one of the Adventist colleges. Okay, he has worked for two. Um, how would you call it, stints or sessions as the uh, president for the mission, I think it's called there. He has been a pastor for many years, well respected. In fact, when people in that area have questions, they will go to him, Pastor Genemo, okay? Pastor Genemo is well known. Pastor Genemo for years has understood the truth about God, but he didn't know anybody else that did. But I'm working with Tibeso. I've been working with Tibeso for about five years now. Tibeso hasn't had anything going on for the first two or three years that I was working with him, sharing with him, teaching him. He's asking questions. He's at the meetings. I finally start supporting him because I know this guy believes the truth. I know it now after about three years. And so we're trying to hold camp meetings. I'm helping him do these different things. Nobody's listening. About two years ago, some people start listening. Now, Pastor Ganemo comes out, shares the truth at a camp meeting, and then the day after, they sh he shares his truth about the, uh, the father and the son at the camp meeting, I release his video interview with me. Yeah. That was on a Sunday. Thursday, he get a call from the conference, you're fired. Oh, you have nothing to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church anymore. You're, you're dead to us. Have a good day. You know? So four days later, he's gone. So that's what's happening. But now, that's in Ethiopia. And as a result of that, that was two weeks ago, this is just exploding. It's becoming viral. People are asking all over the place, what just happened? What's going on? We love what you're saying, Tibeso. We love what Pastor Ganemo says, but now the conference has fired him. What's happening? They're telling us not to listen to Tibeso? What? And so this is really stirring. In India, in Kenya with Eli and uh, um, Onyongo, but also in uh, Ethiopia with uh, Tibeso and uh, Ganemo. But then, of course, in India, that's, this is going everywhere. Ask Pastor Stump. You ask you teach those pastors something from the Bible that they've never learned before, and the first thing they're saying to their brethren that are there, I'm teaching this this coming Sunday. Amen. I'm teaching it to my church. I'm going to teach them. And one day I, I was impressed to hold a uh, truth about what happens when you die when I was the second time in India. And it was early in the morning. It was like my second day there, maybe third. I was thinking, why, God, do I share the truth about death? This is kind of weird. But God made it clear this is what you got to share. And so I shared it. <clears throat> well, I learned right after that message that the day before, one of the very <coughs> famous women in their church de denomination, the, the Pentecostal movement, died. And they're going to be having a ceremony for her this coming weekend. I just told them what happened from the Bible when you die. And so every one of them was saying to each other, and I was learning through translation, we know who's preaching this weekend. And he better be saying the stuff that we just learned <laughs> from the Bible, because that's what the Bible's teaching. And so this is the kind of stuff that's happening around the world. I'm so excited. I praise God that he's using people like you and me. And tonight at the message, I'm going to share a little bit more with that direction. Yes, sir. Any news about that pastor that you got fired? Oh, yeah, he's on fire. He's, he's moving forward. He's doing full-time ministry now. And uh, it's a little awkward because he's got a bad hair day. He just lost his job, and everybody's looking at him like the bad guy. But this is, this is moving forward at the same time. So, yeah, I'm uh, doing what I can to support and and you know, work with him and Tibeso. They're working together. But anyways, keep praying. Keep praying that God just keeps moving these people. Uh, two of the pastors that have done the interview, one of them accepted the message and then turned back and went against it 100%. The other one said, I just don't love it. I see what you're saying, and I'm just going to keep being a pastor. So keep praying for him too. Anyways, thank you for the time. I just want to say, I don't know if this is counted in my five minutes, but I just want to say I appreciate your testimony because it reminds me of what happened in the uh, Millerite movement. Mm. They were shutting the doors yeah. on the people preaching the messages that Jesus was coming. Mm. And they, and um, I think it was, Char was it uh, Josiah, Charles Fitch? 
I think his pastor had told him not to preach, and I think, and they cut him from the church. You know, a brother had went over and encouraged him, and he, he got encouraged and went back and started preaching the messages before he printed the 1843 chart. Um, oh, sorry. Sure. Yeah, just. Well, my testimony is going to be, I mean, it, it, it's years of testimony, so I'm just going to bring out the summary. Um, one of these days I'll be able to share in depth, but okay, my time now. <laughs> All right. Um, my testimony is after I became uh, a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, I started studying in 2005. The first thing I've ever studied was righteousness by faith when I became a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, I had this peace that surpassed understanding. And I was going through a lot, a lot of things. But um, with time, I had started studying um, health message, true education, uh, all the reforms, prophecy, everything. And um, what happened was I went out preaching I, at churches, out on the streets, street preaching, anywhere God sent me, I went. And what happened was I moved to Tennessee, and um, I started having... Um, situations happening in my life personally with family and it was just really hard and I, I lost sight of Christ because I was looking at the circumstances and not Christ himself but at the same time and then I felt discouraged but because I wasn't preaching as I was preaching and teaching and I felt like that was the problem but God convicted me in 2011 that um, I was unconverted he showed me the Laodicean message that I was rich and increased in knowledge but I was in need of something which was his grace he showed me that I had a form of godliness and no power. Mm. And so, um, and I said, Lord, he showed me I left my first love too. I said, Lord, how do I go back to my first love? And he said, you go back to where you first fell in love with me at the foot of the cross. Because what happened was there is where I saw my condition. There is where I saw my need. There is where I could not boast in myself and in my knowledge and my understanding. Because um, all the, you know, like Paul says, you know, chief sinner, and he was, by the law and that's what happens sometimes we get to a point that we know so much that we forget where we came from and we are not humbled to be able to uh, reach others and bring them up from where they are because we feel like we've reached some place and we don't realize we're so far from the truth and so God had um, showed me for three days I had prayed and I asked him to reveal self to me reveal all my sins I just wanted to see self I wanted to give it up and um, for three days I had prayed and he kept showing me things that I had suppressed and he showed me that I wasn't drinking alcohol, I wasn't partying, I wasn't doing all this worldliness, but I had frustration, I had impatience, I was not long-suffering, you know, I was, I was being sarcastic at times, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your family and your friends. Um, and he showed me that we're so focused on the outward sins and he's saying, my son, give me your heart. And so um, he just showed me that, um, that as I go back to the cross, that I acknowledge that, um, you know, that I was a sinner in need of grace and that we should stay there every day. We are um, inspired by uh, our prophet to spend a thoughtful hour each day meditating upon the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Because when you get up out of that morning manna and you go through your day and someone's going to treat you wrong or whatever, you're reminded of what Christ went through. And you're saying, you know what, he went through this, he'll get me through it. He'll give me the power to be able to overcome. And so as you behold him, you become changed. Because as you behold his life and you learn of him, you start to realize, you know, that he is able to do this through me because he came to do this as my example. And so I just wanted to say that to encourage you, because I thought about the theme of this camp meeting, Complete in Christ. It's, it's true. You're complete in him and what he's already done for you. We try so hard to overcome sin. We don't realize that we're trying so hard is the problem. We're not resting in what he has done already for us. That's where the faith comes, to trust that he is able. And as we heard today about the word of God, it is so true, the word of God has power. But that word in itself cannot change you because that seed only has the ability to germinate that God put in it. But Ellen White says that it has to be a divine power that attends the, the, power, the seed that, that waters it. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where the Spirit of Christ comes in. That, the Son, that's where the Son of Righteousness comes in. All that is Christ that 
gives life to that seed to give you that the fruit of the spirit and so and so I just want to encourage you to go back and spend that thoughtful hour because that's why they rejected the message of 1888 because they thought that God was working in a different way. They didn't know and understand the moving of the Holy Spirit. They didn't acknowledge that um, it was by His Spirit, not by power, nor by might, but by my Spirit, says the, you know, says the Lord. And so um, I just want to conclude in saying this, is that, um, you know, there was a person, there was the two men that we have the example for in the Bible that one continued to um, pray and, you know, woe is me and pretty much. And the other one's just like, I'm glad I don't do that. I'm glad I don't do that. And I realized that he was so caught up in acknowledging, Lord, what is my condition that he couldn't even lift up his face to look at his brethren, you know what I mean, to even judge or anything. So I just want to encourage you as we come together here today to let God put self aside through this camp meeting that we can learn to truly become one in Christ that we're not looking at the outward of everyone else or the outward even of ourselves but realize that God is trying to work what's within because it's within that he's trying to change so that we can be able to manifest this on the out. Okay, I'm Manuela Ferreira. Uh, we live in Kentucky. I'm, uh, my husband is Fernando Ferreira and uh, I'm so thankful that I came to this camp meeting. Uh, I could be dead last year uh, on January 14, uh, I had COVID for two years. I never had, but my daughter came from Australia. She's astray, but we tried to bring her to, to the Lord and the two grandkids. And uh, we were super exhausted and we got it. We got it. And on January 14, my oxygen level went to from 99, 98 to 54. And I just said to my husband, my daughter was with us. I said, just sorry, close the door. My husband would pray with me. And I said, please do the fermentations. The Lord is in control. And if he wants me to live, he will do through his, his uh, natural treatments. Yes. Poor husband, he was sick, but he did everything for me. Mm. He said, honey, I said, you, you're not good either. But he said, no, Nella, I need to save you. I said, the Lord will save us. <laughs> anyway, he went to do the hots and colds, hots and colds on me, and the oxygen level just came Amen. to 90. <laughs> and I praise the Lord for everything he does, not only this, but everything, our life is in his uh, hands. And another thing I want to tell you, my prayer was, oh Lord, you brought my grandkids, you brought my daughter and my son-in-law, and it, if it's your will, I still can give the message. Try to help these grandkids, um, whatever it's your will. And not only them, I have a work to do with my neighbors, with whatever I can, through food, through natural treatments, whatever. And uh, sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> but um, uh, <clears throat> my grand, uh, the, the last one, my granddaughter tells me, vovó is in Portuguese, grandma, and said, vovó, thank you so much. I didn't know about the Sabbath. She's six years old. And the other one is three. And now looks like he's stirring up the family because grandma now is bringing the stuff. And I have hope soon, very soon, they will come. Amen. And uh, what I want to tell you, all of you, never discourage. Even if you are almost dying, because uh, my, my daughter sent a message to my son that is a pastor and said, mom is dying. Uh, but the Lord was in control, Amen. and He saved my life, and will save your life. Amen. Okay, last year, I had the camp meeting, and somebody had COVID. Was that last year or the year before? Last year. Last year. And I got it, and was uh, really tired and everything. The pastor got it, and we, we, we both had thermophores. So I started using that every time, and just like the pastor said, every time I used it, um, I felt better. Yeah. And I started to use it several times a day, and within five days, I was uh, back to normal. So that was really useful. Um, so if you, 
I can't guarantee that we'll always have electricity, so it's good to have the, the, uh, the water stuff. I need to learn more about that because we might have to use that instead of electricity in the future. But um, this is a technique that the Adventist Church had years ago, and we need to get back to it. If we don't know it, we need to learn these things because um, um, COVID and other diseases uh, will fall with this kind of a treatment. Yes? What is a thermophore? It's like a big heating pad. A um, oh. This is a big thing, a foot over your whole chest. And I did that to heat up my stomach. And that's where a lot of the, um, the bugs, uh, you know, that, that's where they thrive. Okay. And so you want to heat them and just to kill them, kill them off. I won't, I won't take long. But I was just, uh, I, was, I was trying to think of something I should share because, you know, uh, I'm Brian, by the way. I live in Curacao. Brian Thomas. I live in Curacao. Uh, it's about 40 miles north of Venezuela. I'm here with my wife, my beautiful wife. Um, uh, oh, um, well, I, you know, I, I was trying to think of something sitting over there. I was like, okay, look, Lord, if you want me to say something, then I'll come up here and say something. And I come to understand about testimonies that it's our responsibility to share the things that God has done for us with other people. And I'm pretty sure that the spirit of prophecy makes that clear, that you should come up here and share to his glory yeah. what he's done for you. Yeah. And I was, uh, some time ago, I was in deep prayer. I was asking the Lord, I was like, look, Lord, uh, please lift this vaccination mandate for tourists. I was praying very hard for this, and I don't know if anybody else was, but I was praying hard for it, because I, and, and I, you know, some people might find it hard to believe that God can answer, will answer a prayer for one man on such a grand scale, you know, and it's such a grand scale because the whole world moved at this point. Things were changing. And I was praying. I said, Lord, look, if you'll get this vaccination mandate lifted, I'll expend all of my resources to get my wife over here to this camp meeting. I'll do whatever I can to get her over here because I know that she wants to be here and she's been wanting to come meet everybody for about 11 years and she's never had the opportunity. Yeah. Wow. Just stand up and join you for a second? Yeah, yeah come up here. Come, yeah. come up and stand beside so, uh, so I, I was in really deep prayer and then I, I, I was keeping track of it. I was tr watching what was going on uh, in the United States and I think it was maybe about uh, a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago. I'm not sure Pastor Allen knows. I called him up and I said, look, they lifted the vaccine mandate. Amen. I said it to Pastor Allen and I, and I made it clear that we we're going to try and bring her over. And sure enough, we're here. And he said, well, maybe that means Brother John Christoph can come preach too. And there he is sitting right there. So, so, so the Lord answers prayers. Oh yeah, she she didn't get she hadn't gotten to meet my family for six years too. So uh, we wanted her to get to meet them also, and it's uh, it's just been a real blessing. God, I really believe that God answered my prayer. Amen. Just one man, maybe I don't know. Maybe somebody else was praying for it, but I know that I was praying for it. So. And I was like the first too, like um, going to the airlines. Like I'm after. Oh yeah, we were wondering. We were wondering if she was the first one to get into the United like, States that didn't get the vaccine. Because <laughs> I, I, I booked I booked the ticket. Uh, I booked it for the 11th, and I booked it so that it would arrive on the 12th on 12th on purpose because uh, I was. And the 11th, I was, they were going to lift the vaccine. Right, mandate. and I I booked it to where she would arrive on the 12th on purpose because I was afraid, huh? Maybe they won't let her in on the 11th. So she went to the airport, and uh, I was still in prayer at this point, hoping that she'll be able to get through. <laughs> and the flight, the, the, the guys at the check-in counter, they said, look, the flights, we're not supposed to let anybody fly out on the 11th to the United States. But then he said, well, we're going to let you go anyway. <laughs> so the Lord really answered prayers, and it's been a blessing to have her here. Well, it's so nice to hear everybody's testimonies. My name is Raquel Akins, and my husband's Thomas. And um, I wanted to share a little testimony about, uh, can't hear? Sorry, I have a little louder. Um, so I grew up in Peru, and mostly with just my mom, a single mother. My, 
Oh, wonderful. Um, I did send her a link because she was going to the wrong link. She's like, oh, I'm so silly. I'm going to the church, our church Zoom. Anyway, that I really didn't have a lot of relationship with my biological father. Um, I oftentimes I felt rejected by him. And as a Christian, I knew that I needed to have forgiveness in my heart. And, you know, I, I started thinking just even recently, Lord, I feel like I don't really have love in my, in my heart for my father. There's not, I don't even feel like praying for him. He's not a religious man. He grew up Catholic. What is wrong with me? You know, I, I, I just don't even have that desire to pray for him. I need to be worried about his salvation and my family. And our church is going through a little book that Pastor Allen actually suggested because we're trying to be more grounded in, you know, being a church, what it means to be a church. And it's uh, Light Bearers, what is it? Training Light Bearers. Training Light Bearers. Anyway, it's an old book that the conference put out, the missionary um, was a missionary society or something like that. But it's a really wonderful guide just to prepare and just show you steps on how to do Bible readings, which were really Bible studies. And, you know, I thought, I really, I really want to apply these principles. And so we kind of said, okay, let's, let's try to get somebody to do a Bible reading with. And so the two th thoughts came together. Me thinking about my father and how I needed perhaps to give to forgive in a deeper way and about the Bible. I'm like, I, and I think I asked Brother Todd to pray. I said, let's pray together because we work together in the same office. He's, he's my boss. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm <just talking. laughs> and I'm like, um, Brother Todd, let's pray. I'm going to ask my father if he will do bi a Bible reading with me every week on Sunday. Amen. And he's like, okay, so we prayed, and I sent him a message on WhatsApp. And he said, yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so this Sunday is going to be my, fir my third time, but, uh, you know, he said, when I, the first time that I met with him, he's, you know, I asked him, have you ever read the Bible? And he said, I've never read the Bible. I've never, nobody's ever asked me to read the Bible with them. Oh. And I'm like, oh. You know, and I'm like, wow, now... Why didn't I think of this earlier? Why didn't I, you know, have this notion? And, uh, and so sometimes we do need to pray. When we feel like we're cold towards those around us, we need to pray for God to move upon our hearts. Last Sunday after we had our Bible reading, he said, wow, that was really interesting. Thank you so much. And so I'm praying for his salvation. <laughs> Could you tell me your name? Adelvis Hernandez. Adelvis Edelweiss. That's right. I talked with you in the <laughs> kitchen. Okay, there you go. Can I just pin this for you? Sure. And then you don't have to think about it. Uh, whoops, start that. Okay. Stop. <laughs> there. Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to share uh, my testimony. Um, for 27 years, I've suffered from psoriasis. And um, after um, having it very mild for a long time, it just like broke out and it was really bad. Um, about 80% of my body was covered with it. And so um, I have been going to a specialist who specializes on the disease and I went through many, many medications. Um, um, and things weren't working and then so they switched me to what is called biologicals and I was using a medication for about three years and it worked wonderful it, it cleared all up but after I don't know three four years of using it I started getting side effects um, so I had to leave it I won't go into all the details of that but from that point on it was from from one medication to another and just things weren't working as well. Um, but I, I was going through that cycle. And then um, sometime in around 2011, um, when I had just left the, the one medication that gave me side effects, 
um, I discovered that I had developed psoriatic arthritis also. Um, and so this finger is damaged from it. Um, and so anyway, many, many years went by and now I am in 2019 and I started getting pain in this thumb and I recognized it now and I knew what it was. And so I cried out to God and I um, asked him what I needed to do because I, I didn't want to lose the function of my right hand. I had gotten to the point that my husband had to open every single jar for me, not because it hadn't been opened before. I just couldn't open anything anymore. And so um, I had been a vegetarian for quite some time. I had been vegan for a while. And then I kind of just went back to vegeta mostly, vegeta mostly vegan, but uh, I did eat cheese once in a while. And I prayed out to God, and God told me, no more cheese. And so I left, I stopped eating cheese November 2019. And I regained the function of my hand completely. But that wasn't the end of it. Then um, comes right, um, right around COVID when shuts down uh, happened. And, and then the whole talk about the vaccine came up. Um, God had really been directed me that I needed to stay away from vaccines, period, all of them. Um, I had been over vaccinated when I came from Cuba because I didn't have my records. Mm -hmm. And so they had put me through vaccination all over again when I had had them all as a child. Oh, wow. And a friend nurse had indicated to me that perhaps that's what caused my disease. And so God was in indicating that I should not take any vaccines at all. And now I was faced with COVID vaccines and, and I was made up my mind that I was not gonna take it. But then further to that, I realized that the types of medications that I had been on were sort of the same as the new vaccines. It, it's the same methods that they used to make them. And so God, God put in my heart that I, I had to perhaps stop my medications. And, and then I began to feel the side effects, the same side effects that I had felt before from a previous one. Um, so once I recognized that, I made the decision to stop the medications. And I'm sorry I'm going long. Um, but um, I, I left all the medications. My daughter uh, was pregnant, I was having a baby, and told me that if I didn't get vaccinated, I was not going to be able to see my grandchild. Mm. And so um, I had to rely on, on faith in God that he was going to work something out Amen. and that I was going to see my grandbaby. But um, besides that, um, I just want to praise God because I did leave the medication, and then last, last year camp meeting, we couldn't come because my husband and I had COVID. And so when you get an infection and you have psoriasis, mm. it just triggers it. So I had gone from about 40% at that time because I had already been like a year without my meds. So I went from like 40% soft, you know, cover in psoriasis to about 95% cover and um, as a result of COVID. And so I really, it has been a long journey of, of mm -hmm. listening to God and working with him, mm -hmm. showing me what I needed to do. Amen. And I, I praise him because he directed me to some natural medicines. Uh, it has been a slow, long process, testing of my faith. But I'm to the point that I'm back to about 30% only covering psoriasis. Amen. And, and, and I'm here. <laughs> so I just want to praise him for that. Hello, my name is Curtis Eves. I was an elder in the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church for about 20 years, 20, 25 years. Um, it was a small church. Uh, we had uh, basically th two to three elders. Uh, I was the second elder. We had a uh, head elder, but um, he basically got the position because he lived right next to the church, and he was more uh, focused on 
keeping the air conditioning on and keeping the, the church open. Uh, I was um, the Brian in the, in the church. And um, uh, we uh, uh, got a new pastor. For years, they kept giving us a uh, uh, conservative pastor because we would uh, fight uh, the Potomac Conference to get a conservative pro uh, uh, pastor. But uh, eventually, they one day just brought in a uh, liberal pastor and just said, he's your pastor, and we didn't have any say-so about it. But we started to notice that the pastor started giving us um, uh, tickling ear type of sermons. Um, I think I was the last pastor to do the 2,300 year prophecy on the board 20 years ago. Haven't seen one since. Uh, but uh, we got uh, Ralph Fisher came into our church. Uh, he had, was in another church and uh, came into our church, but then the pastor started to uh, sort of uh, give him a lot of grief and taking away his uh, positions of, uh, in the, because uh, Ralph was good with music and, and stuff. And I started to notice that uh, he was really, when we went to, we had uh, our meetings and stuff, uh, uh, we, I noticed that they, he was always like pointing, at, oh, we gotta do something about Ralph. And, but he would never really tell us what the problem was with Ralph. So eventually my head elder, the pastor told my head elder to uh, go and talk to uh, Ralph and find out what Ralph was all about. Well, being that he was not the Brian, he came to me and says, I want you to go and find out what Ralph is teaching and what Ralph's all about. Mm -hmm. So I started, I went to Ralph and I said, give me what you've got. Show me what you're doing. What is, because you know, you can get so wrapped up as an elder in the church worrying about starting the service, getting the service, and getting things in place that sometimes you miss what the, the stuff that's going on in the background. And uh, so this is uh, when, when I was told to check into this, now my focus had to go to that. And I spent about two years, and uh, uh, Ralph would give me all sorts of uh, books, I think one of the books, what is the, the book, uh, the brown book with all of the, yeah, he gave me that book and all of the, the, the stuff and I started reading that and started reaching into it. But I just wanted to say today that how happy I am that God finally through this system woke me up because I was so involved in the church you know, running the church that I was losing out in something. I could, you know, I love my wife. I love my family. I want them to be in the kingdom of heaven with me. I don't want to make a mistake. And when Ralph came and started showing me these things and the Holy Spirit started moving in my life and I start, because in my, I can't give you my testimony because my testimony is a journey and a spiritual journey. And it's just part of that spiritual journey to wake me up and uh, Ralph woke me up. And so Ralph woke me up and got me thrown out of the church. <laughs> Thank God. Amen. And then Ralph, you know, 20 some years in the Adventist church and this is my first uh, camp meeting oh, because man. my other pastor, he liked to go to church, to the meetings. That means somebody had to preach on Sabbath and that was always me. So all those years later, I finally got to a camp meeting. God, praise God. And I'm here, and I thank Ralph. And another thing, Ralph did a thing on compassion, and Ralph is compassion. You see my problems. You see I have CMT, Chaco Marie Tooth. And because of that, my hands are going, my feet are going. It's a progressive disease. Eventually, I'll be in the wheelchair, and I, I'm having trouble. I can't even, can't even uh, tie my shoes anymore. I can't uh, button a shirt and Ralph and Layla, and thank you, Crystal, for helping me. She's taken out. My wife always gets my meals, and so I don't, you know, I, I can't, I, I have bad balance, and Crystal helped me get my meal, and I thank God for all the Christian people here, and for, the, for Ralph and Layla, and for Crystal, uh, she's part of our Zoom church, and uh, uh, that's true compassion. It's hard for a man like me, who my whole life I've been able to do everything for myself and you know I, I and again sorry to say I prided myself for being self-sufficient now God is teaching me how to be gracious unto people thank you God bless
Okay, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Jean-Christophe. In good French, we say Jean-Christophe. And I'm from France. And, um, and so I will um, share a little bit uh, testimony about uh, how the work is going on in the French-speaking field. And Pastor Daniel had time to share a little bit uh, of things on his side. And it is interesting to, to, um, to know as American people, what is going on on the other side? Uh, we have a several um, uh, missions uh, that we are um, planning to, to set in Africa, in French-speaking Africa, and uh, we have um, plenty of people that are interested. In fact, we are even elders and pastors that, uh, that we're working for the conferences in Africa and that are learning the message, and they want to join. They want to join, but not only they want, they 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 understood the message, but they want to get organized. So uh, we are planning. And by the way, I I should start with this thought. But when COVID nineteen um, came, um, I thought that it was something. Um, uh, should I say? How can I say that? Um, it was kind of uh, like an endurance before you. And I said, Lord, but what did you allow that? Because we did not finish the work, you know, and the work should be finished. And uh, when I, after that, I understood that, okay, uh, you cannot travel, but there, there is a work to do. There is the work to organize, you know. So while you were stuck in France, you know, work on all organizing the work. And so um, this is what uh, we, have, we have done. We have done that in Philippines in 2019, done that in France after and in, in America. You are involved. And so, um, and now, and as the, um, the, the spirit of prophecy says, when the, the organization was set up in the Herald Church, what's happened? The message came across and it was spread in, uh, in, in power. So um, uh, I only have two minutes. Uh, my English is not fluent, so I would like to say much more. But uh, God is working mm -hmm. and let us pray so that his work may go forward. Amen. Have heard of um, Pilgrim's Progress. The people are not known by their names. They're known by their characters. And um, hearing your testimony reminds me of my character. My character uh, was Evans. So I forgot you. Yes. My character is cowardice. Or um, my character could, my past could have been um, procrastination, delay. Lukewarm is a good way to describe it. Uh, a few years ago, I was at Wildwood. I went there as a student. And I had heard this message at 2015. I had some friends, Andy and Christy Whitehurst. And my mom had taught, or either she taught Christy or she, she knew her as a little girl. So they're in family friends. And so she invited me to a, a camp meeting in West Virginia. And just stop me if I go over. I'll cut it off. Watch that clock. Gotcha. <laughs> so I'm thinking, OK, they had some interesting things I didn't know about. And so I think I'm not going to rush into it. I'm going to wait, hear it out, see what it's all about. And at the camp meeting, it was nothing about the truth about God. I mean, at least it didn't stay out to my mind. But they did have literature. And I took it home, and some of the books that really struck my heart was a man named Linford Beachy. And we, even more than the books, his testimony. I was riding with him in the, um, in the vehicle, telling how he went from drugs and pretty much worshiping himself, the pleasure, the God of this world, till falling on his knees and um, his conversion, and how his eyes were opened, his spiritual eyes, and how it just changed his attitude, his heart. And um, so I had this... Um, 2015, I, so I went home and I read these books. My heart was on fire. I thought, what, what's the first thing when you do when you have fire? Fire spreads. Um, but, you know, the, the devil poured some water on me. And I thought, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to, I don't know what's going to happen if I do this. And, um, and I loved the praise of men more than the praise of God at that time. And I didn't share it at church. I just kept it to myself. And, and I had some questions. You know, you're never going to learn it all or know it all. But about the Lord, 2015, the Lord started stirring on my heart. I had some other friends who encouraged me. And one, one thing my friend told me, he's a young man. He was, um, 
a convert from Pentecostal, or uh, not Pentecostal, but he was, he was like my 20s, he was in his early 20s. He was on fire. And he would, um, he, he, he came through a lot of flack when he accepted the truth about the Sabbath. And because um, his whole family's Pentecostal, or in that, that faith. And he came in through Revelation seminar series. And so he was on fire for the Lord. And he shared a quote with me, or he came across it, and I mean, it made me, give me a little spiritual backbone. I said, I, it's now or never. I've got to do something. And the quote was that, um, don't be afraid to show your colors. You know, it's like, um, you know, you hear in the Bible, the man said, I don't remember the story. Some of you, I'm sure, know it. He said, are you for us or are you against us? And it's like, prepare for battle. And um, I remember hearing the story of the iceberg. Ellen White had a dream, a big ship. And there was an iceberg ahead. And the word behind her was, meet it. And so, okay, okay, Lord, I'll stand up for my faith. I'll share what I know. And that promise is, he who begins with little and shares what he has, more will be given unto him. So I start in my dorm room. I'm getting a sermon. Um, I'm getting it ready. And I have PowerPoints. And I'm borrowing screenshots from Natterman Sword. And um, excellent things. And I'm not a speaker. Um, anyway, so we had a student week of prayer. The Lord arranged. And so... Okay, here I am, Lord, send me. And I was the first one, week of prayer. And um, I get up and sharing, and I'm not used to sharing. It goes a little longer, and I can't, it's hard to drive the point home. It takes practice. I'm getting there. Thank you. And so the elder, or the president, is whispering in the, um, the pastor's ear. So the pastor comes up and says, uh, you're out of time, young man. These, and we, these points haven't been proven by the church. Why don't you just, we'll just close the meeting. And later, the president warned me. I mean, um, he says, he, he, I'm, we're friends, but what happened is just didn't. Um, he says, if you share this any more of this, like spread it among the students, some, there's going to be consequences. <sighs> you know, I, I just got there. I had worked for six months to go through this education. So I thought, I'm just going to be quiet. I don't have to cause a stir, commotion. I'll just keep to myself. But there are people who asked me afterwards about it. And it was interesting. And uh, so if the Lord calls you, um, I would say today is the day of salvation. Well, my name is Andy White. Um, I've shared part of this before, so I'll be short. But I just, uh, and somebody, I don't remember who it was, mentioned uh, getting a thought in their head and coming from the Holy Spirit. And, and I've experienced that, and it was it was very powerful. Um, I, I didn't really go to church growing up or anything. And um, when I was about 20, I read part of the Bible, the New Testament, and a little of the Old Testament. But then just went back to my sinful ways. And eventually, and I had asked Christ into my life at that time. But then, I, like I said, I just went, or I should say, kept on in my sinful ways. Uh, I never really gave them up. Uh, and then eventually I just became agnostic and uh, didn't believe anymore, you know. I, you know so fast forward till I was uh, about 40 and, and I had a girlfriend that we had already broken up but she committed suicide and, um, and I took that really hard and started drinking more heavily than I was already and uh, you know, I was just praying to God that I didn't really want to believe in that he would just let me have a heart attack in the middle of the night or something and die because cause I didn't want to live. And uh, so one day I was, as I didn't believe and, and stuff, uh, it was a few years later after she had passed, um, somebody else had passed away and it got me thinking about it more and, and I was just pacing the hallway and I was so angry that a God who I didn't even want to believe existed thinking about eternal torment and imagining her going through that. And the thought came through my mind, but why don't you go see what the Bible says about it? And I was so angry that that thought didn't come from me. And I thought I knew what I would find, and I was like, fine, you know. So I just went and, and typed on the computer, like, what does the Bible say about hell? And find all these verses, and they were contrary to to what I'd been taught. 
And uh, I don't remember how much I read, but I just remember breaking down in tears and thinking, maybe God is real. And Amen. that burden was lifted off my shoulders of thinking about somebody go through that. And, uh, and things have, you know, I've learned a lot since then and, uh, and so many different things and God has put joy and purpose into my life and Amen. I'm just thankful. Hi, actually my name is Crystal Tripp. Nickname is Trippy. I actually got it from high school. I was bullied in school and um, well, a classmate who bullied me with the name of Trippy, actually I learned in senior that it became more poetic for her. It was more like, hi Trippy, how's it going? So, but Daniel already did a testimony with Daniel, so you guys can view that one on that a little bit. But I come from a Mormon family, so I learned about the Trinity and I know about God and I knew about the end times. But when pandemic hit, speed it up, I learned that the Trinity wasn't really real. I mean, it was real, but not as like a third person. The concept I learned about the Trinity from the Mormons was um, like a mother figure. And that's what I saw the Trinity as, as a mother figure. With me, um, when the pandemic hit, I came to another... Um, testimony, not a testimony, sorry, <laughs> a little nervous right now. Um, a person on my Facebook posted a, a video from this guy, David, sorry, I'm not good with pronunciation, Baron, Baron, right, um, and that really caught my attention. So I came to that, but let me go back a little bit, sorry, I jump around. When I get nervous, I jump around, so. <laughs> so I do that. And um, I did come to the Seventh-day Adventist in Ridgecrest, California by a biblical archaeologist, Pastor John Aikens. I don't know if anybody has heard of him, but he's a biblical archaeologist. My mom and I were our friends, of the friends of the fair, so we were there volunteering. His booth was not open on a Saturday, and we were volunteering there. But he had a sarcophagus, a real one, that caught my attention. I'm like, I'm curious. When is this going to open? <laughs> it finally opened. And I didn't know it was a biblical archaeology until he came over and handed us his sermons on it called The Berry Blueprints. And he tied it with actually a Star Wars theme to it. So it came alive. So we started attending that church. Of course, the free lunch, too. So... Um, so that's how I became a little bit more familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist is there. That was 2005. And then I got, um, we kept going. My mom became disabled. I became a caregiver. That's why um, Curtis um, mentioned that because I became a caregiver. I'm learning how to be a caregiver, caring for people. Of course, I've been doing it since I was a little. That's a different story. I'll go on to that one later. Um, my mom, I took care of her for 10 years. She passed away in 2019. I got baptized shortly after December 21st, my birthday. Um, that's also how I got my name too. Because <laughs> it was winter in Utah. A blizzard on that part. But um, I also have been reading The Pilgrim's Progress as well lately. So I do relate what Alex is talking about, so I do actually enjoy that story a lot. And I've been doing the audio version as well as reading it, um, so I do love it. And I became here because I've been praying to actually go to a camp meeting for a very long time. I couldn't do it because I was taking care of my mom. But Brian actually helped out and Faye helped out as well to get me here. So this is my first time being here. Amen. And I love it. I'm enjoying it. I'm Amen. really enjoying meeting everybody and sharing with everybody. I am glad to be here and to meet everybody. Yes. Even her. I am <laughs> grateful to meet his wife. You know, meeting Daniel in person because I was actually on his group uh, 
two years ago, you know, so, and we felt like we have known each other for a long time. And he's like, why haven't we met yet? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I'm glad to meet him here in person. You know, I, I really enjoy it and everybody else on that part. So, um, yes, thank you very much. Yes, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, um, my name is Tishaina Thomas. Um, I was born on the island of Curacao. It's an island um, near the coast of the north coast of Venezuela and about um, 65 kilometers um, away from it. Um, uh, in my island, we speak Papiamento, which is a very um, uh, young language. And uh, um, my country is known for its beautiful beaches and uh, also um, hiking trails too, uh, and also friendly people. Um, before starting with my testimony, I would like to um, go to the presence of God in prayer. Yes, so if you can uh, join me in kneeling yes. in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to thy presence now. Well, actually we all come to thy presence now, Lord. And I wanna ask, Lord, that thou can be with me, that thou can use me for thy glory and thy honor, Lord. I pray that all that I speak may be in accordance to thy will, that thou can bring into my mind um, the, the way that the Lord has brought me out of. I pray that it can be a blessing for thy people, Lord, and um, that many can see how powerful thou art, Lord. I pray that thy name can be exalted and um, thy presence can be with us too and also that um, that we all <laughs> get out of here glorifying the mm -hmm. Lord Amen. I pray this in the name of thy son Jesus the Christ Amen, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay I want to um, name my my testimony from a professed Christian to a Christian. And uh, um, I want to explain, um, I was born in a Catholic family. Um, uh, half, my family is half from Cursa and half from Colombia too. And um, I was raised with my mom. Um, my mom got separated from my dad um, when I was a baby because he was very aggressive toward her. And I, um, uh, I remember um, we were living together, and then um, we went to live with my grandmother. And um, my grandmother, she was a very devout Catholic um, woman. Um, well, she was doing other things out of the Catholic faith, but um, she was um, taking, uh, I remember, <laughs> Um, my sister and I, we were holding her hand, and uh, on Thursdays in the night and on Sundays, we were going to the Catholic Church. Now that we learned something, we, <laughs> we didn't learn anything. We were just coming into church and uh, going out of the church. Um, but my grandmother always had a fear for God, and um, she was um, always, uh, when she... When she got into the Pentecostal church, um, it was, uh, she got more and more closer to God. And she was um, praying for us and praying with us too. I remember um, uh, her uh, reading the scriptures also to us. When we were going to bed, she was um, uh, saying something like, um, in commanding us to God before we fell asleep. And uh, she's really a very, very sweet um, uh, woman. And um, um, I, then um, I, we got from the, I have my notes here, that's why I'm looking down. <laughs> yeah. 
um, we got from um, the Catholic Church to the Pentecostal Church and uh, uh, yeah we, we saw really horrible things and in that church and then from there my mom met some uh, well at the Pentecostal Church they were teaching us um, uh, a lot of things contrary to scriptures um, just the way that they were expelling the demons was like we, we were just baffled ab about it and sometimes my 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 brother and I, I remember we were making fun of the things they were doing like um, flowers and so t and uh, they they were um, they were doing different things like uh, you you had to in order to come to God and receive a blessing from Him, you have to um, give Him something. And there was a day that they require of, of the members, if, um, well, they were telling the members that if they want their prayers to reach to God, um, they will be going to um, Israel, to Mount Sinai, and over there offer um, all the prayers and papers like the people were writing them down and they were um, collecting them and putting them above the mountain and burning them so the prayers can not be listened to and um, they, they were requiring a bunch of money for um, them to go to this trip and do this and from my family um, well they were requiring like um, about thousand five hundred dollars to um, for a family to pay and to do this. And my mom at that time, she was going to do this. She was going to really like sell a lot of our things and, and a lot of, a lot of our, uh, the, the money that we had to really take the money that we had to um, 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 let them bring this prayer to Mount Sinai. Um, but the Lord put it on her heart not to do this. Mm -hmm. and. Um, she then met uh, some nominal Adventist people, and um, we went to the nominal Adventist church. At that time, I was like, um, I believe like 12 or 13 years old uh, that I um, went to the, this church. And um, we met some very sweet people over there, and um, uh, also, I have I learned from the Sabbath, and uh, um, my mom was um, also uh, teaching me about the dress reform, like telling me how to dress and so. And uh, for me, it was very easy, really, to um, to wear <laughs> like what my mom was telling me to wear, like the skirts and so. And uh, well, it wasn't really not the true dress reform, though. It was just um, skirts, but above the knee and and so. But uh, I, I didn't have a problem really with it. I was just um, wearing it and going to church with her too. Um, I was a very rebellious child when uh, growing up. I um, was not listening to my mom. Um, I remember having very, um, very horrible fights with my mom and, and like I was pulling her on her hair and choking her and she was choking me and and <laughs> and, if, and it was very horrible like the way I was like it was truly horrible I my siblings were coming and stopping me and and, and pulling us apart my mom, she was, after this, she was um, calling me to her room and talking to me and telling me, Tisha, um, why are you doing this? Why are you like that? And really um, telling me to change, that I, I sh cannot be a child like that, and telling me how my dad was and uh, that I shouldn't um, follow his steps too. She was telling me what the Lord was putting it on her heart to say to me and um, I 
I went again and, and this continued over and over. I was so rebellious and even with my siblings too, like fighting with them too. Thank you. Yes, fighting with them too and um, um, uh, yes, um, I, I had all that I needed. I had a beautiful family. Uh, we are five siblings, by the way, and uh, um, my mom, my, my stepdad, that um, uh, he took my mom in and took all of us in, and uh, I had um, really clothing, food, everything that I needed, but I wasn't happy. There were nights that I was going to bed, and I was feeling very miserable. I was in bed and uh, crying for hours and hours in my bed. And uh, uh, then uh, I remember I went to, this was about the time that I, I was in, uh, in uh, high school, entering high school. And um, I, in, in high school, I met some friends over there um, that were most of them were people of not of my faith, and uh, uh, I s started to pick up some things that they were doing. At this time, they were reading, it was very popular, the book of Twilight, mm -hmm. and um, such <coughs> like dark books like that, um, that show things of vampires and so. And um, we were passing these books that at that time was bestseller books, we were passing them like, like hotcakes, really like one was reading it and then the other was reading it and then the other one. And uh, um, then we were going to movies too, watching very horrible and uh, dark movies too. And um, uh, I remember um, there came a new girl in the, in the class and she was into the gothic. Um, word and I saw that her and I thought that she was very awesome the way she was dressed and uh, I started to pick up the things that she was doing I started listening to the music she was listening um, uh, which is rock music and heavy metal and very horrible music and I started to dress the way she was dressing too and uh, I had a, a, a double life um, if you please, uh, I, I was um, going to school and uh, wearing like that, like putting black makeup on and, and uh, my hair on my face and uh, um, wearing spikes on my hands and, and so, and when my, my stepdad or my mom was coming to pick me up, I was taking everything off, like, like just taking everything and just acting normal. And uh, I, it was, my mom was very strict. She, she was, um, uh, she feared God too, so she knew these things were not good. Uh, that's why I was hiding it from her. And um, I was reading these books too, and these books were showing very dark and uh, spiritualistic things. Uh, this book were exalting Lucifer as a savior, and they were showing you in order for you to be elevated into a, a, a better state of, of, of um, mind and, and being, you had to do human sacrifices to go into those worlds and, and uh, reach that. Uh, were, this book we're talking about um, uh, carnivalism, so he, um, humans eating um, uh, animal flesh, like raw animal flesh from, from impure animals and um, I was reading this book and uh, I started to practice um, certain things like um, uh, burning, the, they were burning uh, things to call the spirits, evil spirits to come and uh, I was doing this in my room when my mom was not at home, I was doing these things and uh, um, uh, later on I learned from uh, this Sister White that um, she talks about this type of books, and she says that the, these books, they, they come as the characters are very beautiful and very attractive and, um, and nice, but 
um, in it they have spiritual, um, they come with spiritualism and um, that's the way the enemy used things to um, destroy those people that are, are rich, those people that have money. Um, he uh, bring these things to bring his deadly lies. And the people that are poor, he presents um, uh, things like, um, like, like, uh, well, I don't have the, the quote with me <laughs> that, that she, she uh, it's written in the great controversy. Uh, she said the people that are poor, he presents certain things to them too. And uh, also in, a, in another book, she says that uh, these books and uh, the theater and uh, uh, so are things that take our, uh, the children, whenever they read these things, these books, it takes their eyes away from Jesus mm -hmm. and uh, the Bible and they don't um, have that interest anymore in, in godly things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is why I want to say to um, you parents and uh, to be very careful with your, chil with your children and what books they, they read. And, uh, mm -hmm. Well, that time were books, but nowadays we can go a little bit further and, and add to that quote to, to, and say that the, um, the videos they watch, because now everything is... Um, uh, and, uh, on this electronics and the videos they watch, the, the things they read and, and so all this tends to take them away from God. So you want to be there to, to know what your children are reading even in these schools that they go to, um, uh, the schools that are not of our faith. Well, we shouldn't bring our children anyway to the schools but um, I myself went to these schools that they bring this type of books to the children. And um, uh, also we know that the scriptures talks about this too, that they, um, they, the people worship creatures instead of the creator and they do all kind of um, horrible things like sacrifices and, and uh, abominable things. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, then I, um, my mom, she, she was, she found out that I had these books and um, she then, uh, she brought this to an elder of the Nominal Adventist Church and he spoke to me and he was telling me like, uh, he, he was telling me of the, people in his country that was practicing spiritualism and how the devil was using them and uh, um, basically to stay away from those things and, uh, and uh, admonishing me um, in the Lord. And um, he then, uh, he with my mom, they together, they took these books and they burned them. But um, I, I was, it, they didn't burn it in, in my heart. I, I was then going and uh, um, still picking up other books and, and so. And I remember when I, I was about um, 16 years old that I got migraine. And uh, uh, the pain was very heavy and uh, they wanted to give me stronger drugs and so, but my mom refused. And I couldn't sleep well at nights. I, um, was awake and, and hearing like a cracking in my head and, and it was a very horrible pain. Um, this um, uh, pain, um, uh, at, uh, this pain um, came, how, how do you say like, this pain was there <laughs> because of um, my intemperance way of using the phone. I was um, staying up late in the night and sometimes until all night until um, five in the morning using my phone and, and for very um, horrible things talking to people that was in this gothic dark world and listening to um, bad music, watching horrible pictures too. And um, they uh, then um, Whenever I got the migraine, uh, my mom already, she met people from uh, our faith. And uh, there was a sister, her name was um, uh, Sister Alice. 
and she also suffered from migraine. And uh, um, so I was asking her what, what did she do to um, relieve from the pain, and uh, she told me to that she told me that the only thing that she did was she um, stopped eating meat. And I was like, really? That's all you need to do to stop eating meat? And, uh, and she said, yes. And, and uh, um, then uh, I left meat, and uh, I then uh, recovered um, from it. And uh, I remember at this time, my, uh, my mom was assistant to the church of Brother Elvis. Alberto, I'm sure uh, some of you know him, and um, I wanted to, well, I, I had like a hatred to, toward Brother Elvis and uh, um, Sister Julian, because I, I was in this dark world, and I really like, I didn't like people, and, um, but that day it was on my heart to spend a weekend or so at uh, one of the apartments they had in the, uh, it's like the more countryside of my country. So um, I t asked my mom if I can go over there and uh, um, really uh, go and uh, visit them. And um, she, s she found it very strange, but she um, uh, called the brethren and she asked them and uh, they say, okay. And so I pick up my luggage and my things, and uh, I went over there to um, his house. And uh, I start to talk to him. Uh, and it's, uh, Brother Elvis, I start to um, con really s say like all the things that I was doing wrong, all my sins, I was uh, confessing it to him. And he looked at me, and uh, he saw me, and. Uh, and he then told me that I cannot do anything for you. And I was like, like, really? Like, okay, like, what's next? Or, or, or so, like, like. Uh, and then he, um, he told me to come, and then I followed him. And then on the top of the hill, he told me to, um, to kneel down and talk to God. And so I did. I start to um, cry out to God and start to confess my sins to him, all the things that I was doing wrong. Uh, and uh, um, then I went into the house, the apartment where um, I stayed, but I was feeling uncomfortable. Like, like I really wanted to um, go out of that place. And I was feeling so uncomfortable that instead of just walking out of the door, and going to the brother's house and telling him that I don't want to stay anymore, I jumped out of the window. And um, well, everything, the, just, just the wind hitting the roof and, and all of this um, was, um, it gave me like a fear or, or so. And I jumped out of the window and I start to run. Barefoot, I start to run downhill and in my country, there's a lot of cactus like everywhere, but I was running <coughs> through the cactus um, barefoot and just running. And, and while I was running, I was reciting or, or saying the Psalms 91, mm. which was a psalm that I, my grandmother, she, she always um, read, it for, or read it for us. And uh, I, I memorized it, so I was running and reciting Psalms 91. And uh, then um, Brother Elvis, he was um, at the top of the hill, and he called me and told me to shine a come because it's, it's dangerous. Come, come, what are you doing? And so, and um, then I, I came up, and I took him um, on his collar and started to, to really, like, like, shake him like this. And... Um, he then, I was then telling Bible verses to, to him, and he was saying Bible verse back to me, using the Bible back to me. And when he was doing this, there was an anger that rose up on me, like, like a fierce anger, and I was choking him um, more and more. And uh, then he tried to calm me down and took me into his... Um, his uh, therapy room where he does his 
his uh, therapies or give his therapies and um, he tried to um, give me a massage my nervous system was completely out of control um, but uh, he couldn't he then went and called my mom and told my mom to come to um, she said you need to come because because if you don't come then your daughter cannot stay anymore uh, with us uh, so my mom came and my mom told me whenever she came I had my hair like this big and I was um, in, in the bed and um, they then called my grandmother. Well, she knew at that time what was going on. She knew that I was possessed by the enemy and uh, they called my grandmother too and she came and to, together around my bed, they prayed, they started to pray for me. And when they were praying, I was screaming and and scream my lungs out and um, they then um, was they were in prayer and fasting and uh, this took some days like that I was screaming and screaming I didn't eat I didn't drink I was just in bed over there screaming screaming and uh, even the neighbors started to ask what was going on we, we hear yelling in the night of a, a woman was going on and and, and there were they tried to explain to them a little bit what was happening. And um, uh, then uh, my mom was praying, and um, the Lord heard their prayers. To, uh, and uh, um, then I, there was a moment that I was in bed um, screaming, and I felt like very weak, and that I, 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 I didn't have strength anymore. And my mom told me, Tisha, raise up your hand and say Christ save me so I did I raised up my hand and I say Christ I said Christ save me and at that moment all the darkness that was around me and and the the faces of demons that was holding me that I, that I was seeing they were they were gone and um, then uh, then my my um, my mom they brought they made that some remolacha, which is which is a juice um, with red beets and uh, they put I believe um, carrots too to bring me back to health to help me, and uh, um, then my mom was uh, taking the thorns out of my uh, feet, and she said that. Um, in every feet, there was like 200 thorns in it. And um, I was very weak. They tried to bait me and uh, so, but I was um, fainting, like falling down. And so um, my nervous system was out of control. And um, then uh, it took seven months that, well, in seven months, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't eat of myself. I couldn't drink by myself. I, I couldn't read. I couldn't go to school. And uh, um, then uh, my mom started to bring me back to um, health, too, with natural remedies. And uh, Brother Elvis was giving me massage, too, and hydrotherapy to try to um, wake up the body to try to um, to um, to help my nervous system to to function well and um, then they and uh, then they um, th my mom she the Lord used her to help me to memorize my first Bible verse and I would like to take it too, um, if you have the Bible, uh, no, the English one, yes, yes, my first Bible verse that I um, remembered was in Romans, Sorry, just a moment. <laughs> Sorry. 
Susah Akhirat semua Untuk menerbit TV And okay. I would have a gosh Hot flash So okay. if you could please take over And explain to them I'm, I'm not feeling well dude But it's just okay I cannot continue yes. Okay 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 Thank you She's not able to continue. She's not feeling well and um, she's going to have to stop. So we have until our next meeting, which is at 5 o'clock. So you have a longer break now. Thank you for being here. And why don't we, yes, I was just going to say, let's close with a prayer for her. I know the devil does not want this testimony told. And it may be that she'll recover very quickly. Is there some way you could wrap it up because you know the story? Uh, well, uh, sort of, I guess I could Just wrapping up a little bit for us, but let's pray first because she needs our prayer right now. So let's kneel. Pastor Daniel, would you be willing to do the prayer? You're familiar more. We're thankful, Lord, that you've given the opportunity to hear how this dear sister yeah. coming so far from having her mind filled with so much darkness, mm -hmm. is able to see the great light, and you have mm -hmm. blessed her. She's capable. <coughs> She's able to speak. She's able to communicate. She is an intelligent resource of yours, and I just pray that you bless her. Keep her from the enemy. I don't know. We don't know what just happened, but we do know that you see all things, you understand, and you're capable. So we trust that the enemy does not have any ground here as long as we're submitted to you so i pray that you would receive us all thank you for this and bless this dear sister her husband and the work that they're doing thank you for this and bless us in jesus name amen so brian if you could just wrap up the rest of the testimony because you know that she became she was victorious right yeah wow she, she might just be feeling sick or so. I don't know what she said to you. Well, she just said she cannot continue. She's having a um, headache. A headache, a hot flash. Yeah. She just didn't feel well at all. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, sometimes she has that kind of issue. But, uh, well, you know, as far as her story goes, um, she eventually she eventually began to attend pretty faithfully with Brother Elvis and Sister Julian. And she started to learn more and more about the truth, and uh, she was on the road to, it seemed like a complete victory or recovery or something like that, but then uh, she did say that she, she mentioned to me that she was uh, not completely victorious, to say the least, that she was still online looking for guys. I happened to be the one that got the hook. And, uh, you know, uh, we fell pretty hard, and we fell together. You know, I wasn't an Adventist at the time, but I, I, was, I did believe in God, and I was trying to follow Him as best as I knew how. And uh, whenever we, we did fall together, we ended up living a, a, in a life of fornication. You know, it was pretty bad. And it was for a year, almost, that we were troubled by this issue until I finally uh, I was praying, I was asking God to please help us get married, you know, and, and he did. We got married and then uh, we went to, we, we finally moved out to West Point, actually where, where Brother Elvis is at right now. And uh, we were fortunate because Brother Elvis felt, uh, I guess he felt the conviction that he would like to perform our religious ceremony for us. So he did that for us about three years ago, which was actually, it was really small, very, very humble. You know, it was just her grandmother, uh, another witness, maybe like three or four people there at the wedding, not very many. And uh, we, we were married there too, uh, because I acknowledged the Adventist faith not too long before that happened. And uh, I don't want to turn it into my testimony, but it's, uh, it's hers. But, as far as I've seen, she's doing really good, you know, she's being very faithful and, and she's helping me too. She helps me in so many ways I can't even ex begin to explain it. So she's, uh, she's been, 
what can you say? She's been the, the, the tool that God has used to iron out a lot of the kinks that were in this, this sodden character here. But, uh, um, sorry, it's on the fly, so I'm kind of having to think about okay. what's, what's happening. I just think that the story was going to be told Satan has tried to stop it, and you could just complete it, and we'll keep going. Yeah, uh, you know, well, do you, do you see the story, how it's going? You know, I don't think that there's anything spe specifically spiritually wrong, I, but she does have physical issues that prevent her from being in front too much, and she gets if she gets too excited or something like that, maybe the blood was flowing a little too much, and she might have been a little nervous. I don't know what was going on, but uh, I'll ask her about it later. But uh, she's she's been doing really well. She's been staying really faithful, and she's been helping me stay faithful too. And you know, Jesus Christ is working with both of us in a special way. Amen. And uh, Amen. and uh, the further we go, the stronger we get. You know, I was thinking about. Um, I was thinking about this, and this is something that I'd, I've told her too before, that I believe that the process of sanctification is a very, very tough path. You know, it's not, God never said it was going to be easy. And I've noticed that through, uh, through the process that God is taking uh, me specifically is I used to hear him saying, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that, but after after listening to the Word of God so much, being uh, absorbed in His Word, it's changing into something else. It's changing into I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. It's no longer you don't want to do that. It's I don't want to do this, and I think that that's what the process of sanctification is. And we're both still going through that, obviously. So. Uh, the Lord is going to work in a special way. Amen. And I think that uh, my wife, I'm not going to speak for her, but I think that she was probably going to ask some of the brothers here at the church to do like a, an anointing ceremony for her. Mm. So, I think she, she could still do that. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll see if she still wants that, but uh, I'm pretty sure she's going to ask for that. Okay. So here we are, Thank trying you. to serve the Lord. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we have heard your name being praised for so many different things here this morning. And it is truly awesome what you are doing and have done in so many lives here. And Lord, what you want to do. And so Lord, as we continue through this week, we pray you'll continue to bless, be with those that are still traveling and on their way. And again, thank you so much for all you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we have heard your name being praised for so many different things here this morning. And it is truly awesome what you are doing and have done in so many lives here. And Lord, what you want to do. And so Lord, as we continue through this week, we pray you'll continue to bless, be with those that are still traveling and on their way. And again, thank you so much for all you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And, and talk to the people online. We will try to broadcast the 305 testimony and, of course, the 5 o'clock meeting both. Very good. Yes, thank you very much. For those online, thank you for joining us again. Um, 305 will be back here on the air, and we're going to have the testimony here. And then at 5 o'clock, we're going to have Brother Rob Chisholm's presentation. And so please come back for that. God bless.